Hey friends, Lee Brown, and this is crazy shit in real estate. And today's conversation is all over the place because we're going to talk about racial issues in housing. We're going to talk about stupid city policies that need to get fixed and how realtors fix them. And we're going to talk about fostering and adoptive kids. And so if you didn't expect any of that, obviously that's why you're here. So Nikki Raycart is with us. Her heart is as big as Texas, even though she's in Ohio. So enjoy this conversation and I'll see you on the other side. Hello, Nikki. Hey, Hey. how are you? How are you? Good. Good. Why is my my watch is not connected? So one of my girlfriends was like, are you alive? Because she couldn't see my Uh, It's not sharing. Oh, my goodness. uh, And that's when I know I'm obsessed with my stupid gamified watch here. So. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. And look at your cute earrings matching your necklace. I admire the accessorizing. I love earrings. They're like my jeans. I wear them all the time. So are those made out of leather? Because they look like some one of my girlfriends has that are made out of leather. Yeah. Actually, I think maybe I had these on when I met you because you asked me about this company. You're the same ones? Yeah. Yeah. So I gave that link from Instagram to one of my girlfriends. She bought like five pairs of them. And now that's all she wears. Yeah, Nickel and Suede. They're amazing. So they should give you all the credit. We're going to tag Nickel and Suede in this episode so they'll know that after I saw Nikki's earrings in Ohio, I (laughs) told a girlfriend who now wears them all over North Carolina. And so I'm always referencing her earrings. And it's because of Nikki. So Nickel and Suede should give you like a coupon or a free pair or something. I'm here for that. Yeah, totally. Makes you an influencer, I think. Just saying. Yeah. So welcome to the show. Thank you. And of course, I just referenced that we met at a real estate event in Akron slash Cleveland, Ohio. And mm-hmm. I would love for you to tell our audience a little bit more about you, how long you've been in business, how long, how you came into real estate, any kind of little tidbits to tell us who Nikki is. Okay. Um, I am a baby realtor, like baby. Early career. So- early career. Yes. Uh, this is actually my second year and what I did prior, I have six kids. Um, <laughs> you are repopulating I, the earth sister. Good job. Oh, my Atlanta. Um, yeah. So I have four home baked and two adopted. Yay. And then in between my, so my oldest is, um, you know, going to be 23 and I have a grandbaby. And so like in between, my youngest bio, who is 18, and my nine-year-old, we had 48 foster kids over a period of 10 years. So honestly, I hear a gift straight from God himself. You are. Uh, not really, but um, yes, yes, you are. I mean, we have a major shortage here of foster families, especially for respite care. So everywhere, that many everywhere. kids in your house, you are a, you are a saint. <laughs> So I think that foster care and real estate are the same. They're one and the same. And I think it prepared me to, you know, basically put out fires all, you know, all the time, herd cats and just kind of keep everyone um, regulated. Like regulation is a huge thing with foster kids. and, And I think keeping your clients regulated is huge because of all the ups and downs, right? Like through the process. And so I am able to, I think pretty easily keep them calm, talk them through it. Like it's kind of what I've been doing forever. And so I think it's really helped me as I've come into this career mid midlife and I absolutely love it. So I'm guessing nothing rattles you at this point. There's no story that you could hear, no scenario you could walk into that would shake you because you're like 48 foster kids. I've seen it, heard it, and got all of this. Nothing makes my jaw drop. Like I'm the mom that everybody calls when their teenager does something or their kid does something. And I'm just like, yeah, no big deal. I can talk this. Don't even worry. <laughs> and, and trust me, this is not the biggest of your concerns. <laughs> yeah, no, no. This is a molehill. Don't even worry. All right, so we'll talk about real estate in just a second. How did you come to be a foster family? Did you and your husband just feel called to do this? Or was there a specific scenario that caused you to apply and you just fell into it? Because there we just you I mentioned that you said absolutely you got the same problem. 
there's a major shortage out there in the world of foster families. And I think a lot of people just don't have any knowledge of it because it's it's scary. If you watch TV, you only hear about the worst scenarios and heaven forbid you read a book or watch a movie and then it's always worst case scenario. So what can you share with us about how you got into it and what you know about that space? I grew up in a home that could have fostered. I could have been a foster kid. So I just kind of had a heart for them. As I got older in my twenties, I thought it was a crazy idea for anybody to do it. Um, In our thirties, we really did feel called to it. We especially felt called to sibling groups and teenagers because those are the groups that nobody wants. Right. Um, They're the scariest group but I think they're the easiest. Um, Raising toddlers in foster care who have been neglected is a lot like a feral animal. Mm -hmm. And that's not like, I'm not being facetious. Like it's just, they're, they're wild. Um, And they're 24 seven with you. And when you have school age kids, you at least have a break. Um, And I always wanted, like, we always imagined if something happened to us, our kids went into foster care, like we would want them to be able to stay together. And it's pretty rare that siblings can do that. And they're, that's all they have, you know? So that's kind of like where we started with that. Um, It was totally trial by fire. You know, we didn't know what we were really getting into. And that's what I would, there is a high need for sure. I am the person who will tell you the good, bad, and the ugly about foster care. I'm not going to put rose colored glasses on you and then throw you into the wolves because it's not a good idea. Um, so yeah, people can obviously reach out to me if they have questions about foster care or adoption. I I'll answer them honestly. And I'm going to hope that anybody with that kind of character and steel will reach out to you because if we fill the missing gaps with great people who have a heart yeah. for helping a kid get on the right path, you could literally change the path of our entire culture and society by being those kind of families. And we have mm-hmm. good friends personally who they took in a sibling group of four and yeah. then the bio parents had another kid who immediately got sent into foster care. So they said, yeah. absolutely. We'll take this child. And the court said, well, we don't want you to have more than four kids. And so our friends had to say, this is a sibling group. You need to make an exception so we can have this fifth kid because these kids need to be together. And they had to go through a court battle just to take the other sibling into foster care. It's how broken that system is. And now they're currently in the fight of their lives to adopt these kids because nobody really wants them except to use as a weapon against each other. And as a, as a mom, it, it, it infuriates me and makes me sad at the same time that, those kids are being treated like that when they could actually be the next Beethoven. It could be the next uh, amazing (laughs) Thomas Jefferson thinker. I mean, I mean, you can't watch American Idol or any, any of those kinds of shows without a foster kid coming on and having been adopted or in a foster home or even back with their bio parents. But like, you know, they're amazing. They're amazing. And I don't want to say resilient because I think that's overused. (laughs) I think if we're also resilient, why are all these adults in counseling? (laughs) Well, I would say that a lot of them, if they've got the right guidance, have learned the skill of resilience because resilience is a skill. And actually talk about the overlay into real estate Mm -hmm. as we go into a changing market. And for those of y'all that are tuned into this episode, we're recording in July of 22. And so the markets are currently changing right now. Realtors are going to have to be resilient as they counsel and guide and educate buyers and sellers, because anytime the market makes a change, Mm -hmm. a lot of people fall back because that fear sets in. And so it's, I I can't fix it. So I won't do anything, but that's not the right response. The right response is to lean in. And so as you think about those, those parallels between the two worlds, I love that you brought that up because it's absolutely relevant right now and should be something you take in with you as you talk to buyers and sellers and help you understand (laughs) it. You know, it's, it's all part of the process. So in your first almost two years, I'd love to know what you've encountered that has surprised you about real estate, because I think in real estate, it's fascinating that we don't prepare new realtors adequately for what they're going to encounter 
in dealing with the public, in dealing with the public's largest financial instrument and the amount of good realtors can do and the amount of damage realtors can do if they're not fully educated. And you basically are thrown to the wolves in this business. So what have you right. encountered that has been, wait a minute, what in your eyes? If you are remotely awake, then you know that we are heading into some really tricky economic times. We have home buyers that have put the kibosh on buying because they have interest rate shock. We have sellers who have found out suddenly their houses aren't dipped in 14 karat gold. And as a realtor, you are still trying to keep up with the business you have and trying to answer questions in the meantime, while also managing sky high fuel cost at the pump. Never fear because my new video course is coming out right now and it's called how to dominate during a recession. Look, I've been a realtor for 22 years. I came through the last recession by the skin of my teeth, actually not even the skin of my teeth. My business went up every year during the great recession and it's all because of education and getting in front of the curve so that I could serve as many neighbors as possible and help them weather this storm as well. So this course is four modules. There might even be some bonus content for you. And I have priced it so that everybody can get a hold of it and go out there and do great things for the American dream and for home ownership. The price is $1.99. Click on this link. If you take action, you can be the one who brings great information and great solutions and also paired with realism and optimism into the marketplace that you serve. I am delighted to bring this out as quickly as possible because friends, there's no time like the present to make sure our neighbors are stronger and we protect the American dream. I think what's been the craziest is nothing to do with the clients or the market, but that there are so many agents out there who just don't even call you back. Um, I have a hard time understanding this part of the business. <laughs> and maybe this isn't where you wanted to go, but like that really yeah. is for me. Bring it on because communication is the number Deep. one cause of, of disputes between the public and their realtor, between mm-hmm. realtors and their realtors. And it's it seems so basic that if you call somebody, they will call you back. Or if they can't it call does. you back, they will text and say, Give me just a minute. It's yeah, we're in a world of instant communication and we get zero. Right. Yeah. So honestly, that's it. Like just the communication part of it. Um the you know, the fact that I I can't get into homes because no one will will confirm my request. (laughs) And maybe that's a Cleveland thing. I don't know because it didn't happen. I was an agent in Washington and I I didn't necessarily have that problem so much. Washington state, but things are very different on the West coast than over here. So that's maybe been my biggest eye opening thing was um, like the point of sale here is not a thing. Like that was mind blowing for me having a point of sale. And I don't know, I'm sure you know about point of sales. I'm not sure if they're where you live or not though. Go ahead and describe that because our audience is made up of not just realtors, but also the consumer public. And the more they know about the details of real estate, the better questions they can ask of their realtor. And hopefully anybody listening to this is thinking of hiring a realtor. You're now realizing you better ask what their communication style is and what they believe urgency looks like. Often realtors will ask our, our potential buyers and sellers that, but I have yet to have a buyer or seller ask me what they should expect for communication. And if I'm hiring a realtor, I'm asking that question. But that was about the point of sale though. So explain what you're talking about, the difference between West Coast and East Coast. So point of sale, as I learned, is like the city. I live in Shaker Heights, Ohio. So like the city of Shaker Heights sends an inspector to your home when you want to buy it, when you want to sell it. And they tell you everything that's wrong. It could be a cracked uh, plate, electrical plate on your wall, like a switch. It could be... Um, peeling paint. It could be some cracks in your sidewalk that you need to fix. I mean, it could be, it could be anything um, that they choose. (laughs) Every house, every house, regardless of age, regardless of anything, every house during the city looks at it. Mm -hmm. And you have to pay for this to happen. How much? A couple hundred. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to get them into your house? Does it delay things? um, It's about probably a week when you they'll schedule a week to two weeks of them they come out they create a report 
they um, then sent to you. So we, okay, so once you get the report, you can fix everything as a seller and sell it point of sale compliant, or you can, in this market, make the buyer assume the point of sale. So when that happens, either way, the city of Shaker Heights in particular makes you get two different bids from two different contractors on how much it's going to cost to fix all of this. We had a seven page report, <laughs> single line, seven page report. Um, we bought a century old home with a, a widow who lived here for 40 years and didn't do anything to it, who ended up having dementia and you know, just like the house needed help, but we really wanted to restore her. It was just right. an amazing house. So, uh, and because we had the funds ava available, it was okay, but we had to give the city $17,000 to hold an escrow. And they hold that until we fix everything. And then we get our money back after they come inspect. So we... Um, are you serious? This yeah. is insane. This is insane. And I don't know why, like as an outsider, because I've only been here since September as an outsider, I'm just like, what is going on here? Like, this seems like, I'm going to say it, but it seems like redlining to me because only a certain population can throw that much money in and still afford to fix this. Hmm. And so it's a very strategic, and it did come up this this point of sale policy came about at about the same time when they did start strategically redlining. In the 40s um, and 50s? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. The history of this little area here is pretty wild. Um, so it's not Cleveland yeah. and Akron doesn't have it. Just Shaker Heights has this? So it's like mostly East Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland proper and the West Cleveland don't don't have it so much. It's the Heights, so Shaker Heights, Cleveland Heights, um, Euclid Heights, uh, it's or South Euclid. Yeah, yeah. So you, the city of U Euclid, which is close by here, um, they actually did just kind of deem this a little racist, racist, and they went away with people having to put money in the escrow, but they still have the POS that you have to become compliant on. Um, so in a seller's market, you no. let's see which market. So not in a seller's market, yeah, you just restrict your buyer pool because like you said, not everybody exactly. has funds and the seller doesn't exactly. have to wait for somebody who has it. Cause they've got right. a laundry list of people to pick from. And so I guess if the city wants to make sure they've got valuations up to date and they want to verify code violations and permit violations, this is one way to do it, but that you're right. Putting that money in escrow, that's going to restrict a lot of people's ability to get into the housing market. I, I've i never heard of this. this is exactly. Exactly. Stupid. It is yeah. stupid. Yeah. So, so I would really love. To put, what did you say? Is there any movement afoot to make this get fixed? I don't know. I, I know that. Um, like I said, I know that Euclid did just kind of change it a little bit. That's the only movement that I've seen. And I don't know why people haven't fought this, but I think a lot of people in this area who have grown up here forever are just like, this is how it's always been. Right. And I'm like, this is still wrong. And like, you guys just don't know you've drank the Kool-Aid and, and you are being poisoned, <laughs> you know, like in my opinion, I feel pretty strongly about it. I just, I can't stand it. And so as an agent, you have to make sure, you know, that's something extra that no, no other agents have to do. We have to make sure they get that compliance or the list and make sure someone's going to assume it. Like it's a, it's a whole thing. So is this something you're better off doing at the beginning of a listing so that you know what you're dealing with, or do you wait until you're under contract and then negotiate? No, no, you, you, the seller has to go to the city and get this list ASAP because the buyer is not going to write anything up unless they know if it's compliant or what is on the list. And then you share that list with the buyer, you know, to show them what they're, what they're up against and what they're assuming. Um, All right. So what if it's a for sale by owner? Do regular normal people in the market know they have to go to city hall and do this? Or is it mainly probably in not? Real but I'm assuming it's pretty well known because it's been here forever. 
in order to buy or sell. People stay in the house forever. They don't think about these kinds of things. Well, and a lot of people stay in their house forever because they don't have the funds to fix their house and do with the city because the city doesn't come in unless you're buying or selling. I don't like this at all. And I think that help me, Lee, help me. (laughs) Well, I'm going to suggest that you bring this to the attention of the leadership at the Akron Cleveland board and ask them if government affairs is actively engaged in addressing this with the municipal (laughs) officials, because this is something that is the reason realtors do politics because our politics are not the stuff that you see on the national stage. It's very non-sexy stuff to deal with point of sale, to deal with property taxes, to deal with these kinds of issues, but realtors are the ones that can impact it because we see that impact on there's people in the population who now are blocked from the American dream because of Mm -hmm. an antiquated rule. Mm -hmm. And we should be in those rooms as I would, I'd be calling your leadership and asking them what they're doing. If they're not doing anything as a member raise your hand and get on that government affairs committee and then push this conversation forward. Because I know that as a leader myself, if somebody brings this to me, I'm going to drop it on the agenda. And I'm going to say, let's run with this because it can be fixed. And the squeaky wheel does tend to make the progress and realtors Mm -hmm. can absolutely be squeaky wheels. We're very skilled at that. Yeah, we are. (laughs) Definitely. And especially if you were to get maybe uh, get HUD involved in this, because, you know, the yeah. current secretary of HUD is Secretary Fudge is from Ohio. I bet if she knew uh-huh. about this, she could be a part of that process. Do you know Marcia Fudge? No. So she's a congresswoman from Ohio, and she was the Biden administration's appointment to housing and urban development. Oh, OK. I'm writing her name down right now. And since HUD administers a lot of the fair housing programs and they're looking for anything that is going to be keeping people out of housing for no fault of their own, which would be exactly mm-hmm. what this sounds like. Yeah. I think that this is exactly why we have, I'm, I'm not a fan of government regulation to be very fair. I don't like big government, but if we're going to have big government, this is the kind of thing it's supposed to say, that's not right. Let's yeah. wipe it out. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a, it's a, feels very much like a, a little, nanny state right here it's icky it's very icky and gross yeah. and it's a technical mm-hmm. term for that yeah, yeah. Nikki, i think that you might be uniquely cut out for fighting this fight as a <laughs> mom who has fought for your own bio kids adopted kids and 48 foster kids i think you can handle getting rid of a silly old statue that <laughs> we'll see we'll see no I i'll look into it, it. i'll look think, into it you should and i'm going to expect you to follow up with me after you reach out to your leadership because you do have an amazing leadership team at ACBAR, which if you're a normal person, that's the Akron Cleveland Board of Realtors. And so they will, I think, take this into consideration. I've seen the list that your incoming president has of priorities. He is ready to roll. And I, something tells me this would land on his list. Okay, cool. All right. So I, I'm so glad that you brought this up because I'm. it's amazing to me. But this, friends, though, is why... I can't stress to you enough that your local realtor is your resource on real estate. It's not the national news, which would have no knowledge of what's happening in Shaker Heights. It's not even national real estate news, which has no knowledge of what's happening in Shaker Heights. And it's your local realtor who gets this, not even an app that might use an algorithm to give the number for your house. It doesn't matter what the app says your house is worth if you're going to have to jump through $17,000 worth of hoops to sell it. So right. you, you call a realtor, but I think if you're interviewing a realtor in Shaker Heights, I think one of the first questions you ask after the communication question, which is very important, would be talk to me about how I can best handle point of sale. And the consumer yeah. needs to ask better questions so they can get better realtors, which is how we fix the gap of professionalism in the business on the whole. Yeah, I agree. All right. So Nikki, let's just say that in this dumb world of point of sale, you've got this list from the city. What happens next? Do they have to come re-inspect? And what, what are the, how many steps are we talking here to get through the process? Right. So you get the initial inspection, the buyer or the seller does the improvements. You call the city and have them come re-inspect. When they re-inspect, 
they check everything off the list, but a lot of times they add more things to the list that they didn't see before. So it's, it's never, it's not going to end. They don't want it to end. Yeah. It feels a bit like a racket. Um, and it feels a bit like, I mean, you have no control. You can't fight it. It, it, it is what it is. Do you have to pay every time they come out too? Um, I think you get two free ins- reinspections. Yeah, two free. And the third one, like a- after that, you would have to pay. Mm-hmm. This makes no sense to me. So I'm so glad that you've, well, I'm glad that you're there fighting for buyers and sellers to understand how they can make it through that gauntlet because at the right. end of the pain in the tail is still home ownership, which is still right. what we Worth want it. everybody to have a chance at. So right. you go to the go to the closing table. Is there anything else that has has got the back of your mind thinking something needs to be fixed? <laughs> a lot of things need to be fixed. Um, well, I don't know. I think that things need to be dealt with racially. Like what? That, like just acknowledging that the deeds in Shaker Heights all have way back. And I, I don't mean recently, but, but way back, the city had some pretty racist roots and the deeds have no Jews or Blacks on them. So in the, in the deed, the deed that's recorded at the courthouse, it says you can't live in this house if you're Black or Jewish. Yes. Okay, so that's... I mean, it's obviously not imposed, correct? (laughs) Well, it can be, right? So in 1948, there were, there was laws that came out in 1948 that said you can't enforce any of that. And so what has driven a lot of realtors crazy is that if you ask an attorney about it at closing, they're like, oh, it's not enforceable. Like it doesn't mean anything, but whether we want to admit it or not, if you're buying a house and let's say you're a black and you're Jewish, let's just say you're both groups and you look at the D and you're like, what, what the what the hell? I can't live here. And the lawyer's like, eh, it's not enforceable. It's still not going to make you feel like you're wanted no. there. And so yeah. I'll point out that in North Carolina, where I'm located, we've brought this up to the legislature because there's a lot of old race related deed restrictions in our old houses. And even if it's not enforceable, most of us that are, you know, decent humans want it gone because it's stupid and it's outdated. Exactly. And it's, yeah. it's evil. And so We've been told, well, you can just fix it one by one. And so they'll, we can get it fixed at closing, but I would personally like to see just statewide get it fixed. But the argument we've gotten back is that would be so expensive, which I find it fascinating that the government can spend money on all their little pet projects, but won't fix something that actually impacts the American dream. But I will point out there is a success story in the state of Wyoming, the past president of the Wyoming Realtors, her name is Shelley Duncan, and I love her to pieces. She ran for state Senate after she was realtor president, and she introduced legislation at the state level that they get rid of all of these racial related restrictions on deeds. Mm-hmm. She got it, of course, bipartisan support. It sailed through, and so statewide they fixed it. So I know that Wisconsin, they Wyoming. Wyoming, really. Wow. Yeah, so if you can do it in Wyoming, you can do it yeah, in Ohio, sure. and we can do it for in sure. North Carolina. And I think that the public just doesn't know it yeah. still exists because it's not enforceable. But well, I, because I, it's so far back, most people don't look at their deeds. You know, they're they that's don't the read anything. We're, yeah. We have a population that's allergic to going beyond a headline. Right. As a realtor, you should be willing to ask the attorney. To vary if the house, hey, granted, if the house was built in the last 20 years, this is not your issue. Yeah. But if the house was yeah. built in 1930, to ask the attorney, can you make sure there's no racial or ethnic issues in the deed? And if so, can you please modify the deed? Because you can modify the deed at closing. Somebody, so we don't have attorneys in Ohio, we use well, title and escrow. So the, it, the title companies have attorneys. Okay, okay. The attorney and the See, title. I'm a, newbie. I'm a newbie. I'm just still learning. <laughs> so your early career. You're not new. Your early career because you're going to be in this a long time. Because obviously we need you out here, being <laughs> eyes and ears on the street. Because this is good. Yeah. But if you're at a title company, you ask that title attorney. I need you to fix this because they can. At the time of closing, they can fix that deed. Okay, this is good to know. 
And our buyers and sellers, again, going back to things they should ask, if you're a normal person looking to hire a realtor, this is another question to ask is, what do you know about racial restrictions on deeds? Yeah. And if your realtor doesn't know anything about it, then they're not as dialed yeah. in as some others. So maybe there's still a great realtor who's not paying attention. So those of y'all that are realtors on here who are paying attention, carry carry the torch, be like Nikki yeah. here and go into these situations and say, this needs to get better because we can and we should. And I do want to just say, like, I, I'm not trying to bash Shaker because I love this little city. Um, I think it's amazing and gorgeous and so much to offer, but there are some things that are like the underbelly is not pretty. And I think we should address it. So that's you know all. what it's like with our kids, right? I, yeah. I have two teenagers. If I don't correct them, I'm not doing my job properly. And I love them more than anything. I wear my heart on my sleeve because of my kids. If I don't correct what they're doing wrong, they don't have a chance to be better in the future. And that's what you're talking right. about here. We love yeah. Shaker Heights. We also want the best version of Shaker Heights. And so we right. have corrections where we see it. Yeah, exactly. Because moms <laughs> rule the world, apparently. That's how right. we it. Because I'm a, my mom text thread is my most powerful thing on this phone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nikki, I love you for bringing this to the show. This is exactly <laughs> the kind of topic I love talking about here. And okay, good. Friends, if you're in Ohio and you want to help Nikki in this fight, you need to drop it in the comments and reach out to her. And Nikki, what's the best way for people to find you if they want to come learn about Shaker Heights, which is very beautiful, by the way. I love the yard. It is. It is. So nice. Best running trails ever right through there. But outside yeah, of yeah. that, if you want to make the real estate market better or be a part of that, how can the people find you? Um, they can find me on face all the socials under my name, Nikki Reichardt, um, or Shaker Heights Realtor at gmail.com is my is my email. So and of course I'll have all of Nikki's contact information in the show notes for this episode so you can reach out and connect. And by the way, Nickel and Swade, I know that you've now listened to the whole episode because you are fascinated <laughs> to see your product on display. If you want to be a part of making housing more accessible for all people in Shaker Heights, I mean, we welcome corporate partners in the fight to improve fair housing. So you can you can join us too on that. But Nikki, thank you so much for coming you're on. Welcome. The show. And thank you for what you're doing in the lives of so many people on a personal level. And also thank you for what you're about to do to impact people you've never met. Oh boy. <laughs> thank you for having me so much. Super fun. All right, friends, make sure you give her a follow on the socials, reach out to her, leave something nice about her in the comments and <laughs> subscribe so I can see you next time. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel, turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you want to learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous. No judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.